Okay, so we can start. Um, so we were talking about Gettel's uh, incompleteness theorem, and so let me restate what we want to show. So Gettel's incompleteness theorem And the, the kind of to be in the right mindset, we're trying to find a set of axioms that will uh, describe what's correct and what's not correct for the natural numbers. We know already that we cannot define the structure of natural numbers. Why can't we define the structure of how do you know that we cannot have a First order set of formulas that defines the structure of natural numbers. Yes. Right, because of the non-standard models. But note that so non-standard models show us that we cannot find. So we want to define the model of natural numbers: zero, one, two, n, and. We write some formula, set of formula sigmas, and we took sigma to be the set of all possible formulas that hold in the natural numbers. And we ask, does it define this structure? And it turns out that we also have non-standard structures that also satisfy sigma. But the fact that they satisfy this sigma means that there is no formula that holds here and doesn't hold here. That's the whole point. The whole point is that they satisfy exactly the same formulas. But what we are after is a way to find out which formulas are satisfied by the natural numbers. These are the questions the mathematicians ask. What are the statements that are true about the natural numbers? So we actually are trying to figure out this, not trying to define it uniquely but trying to figure out what are the formulas here. Now, the problem with writing it like this, this is the set of all formulas that hold in natural numbers, is that we don't have any way of check, given a formula, if it belongs here or not. So this is where the Gettle's theorem comes uh, into play, and it says there is no proof system that satisfies the following three requirements. So soundness, for the natural numbers, which means if I prove something and it's true in the natural numbers, and secondly, completeness, for the natural numbers means every statement that's true about the natural numbers is provable in my system. And the third one is checkable, which means there is an algorithm or procedure that on every input string uh, finds out if it is a legal proof or not. And the checkability is what's missing from the attempt to say, let's take all the formulas that hold in the natural numbers. Okay, so that's the Gettle's theorem. What I want to do is to prove it and then discuss some of its consequences, because it is this really a, is a revolutionary theorem in mathematics. It changed, the, as I said last time, it changed the way we're thinking about mathematics. Because it tells us that if we take any notion of what is 
provable, what is a valid proof in mathematics? Any notion that we have. Mathematical proof is any mathematician understands it. So probably it satisfies soundness. We believe that everything we prove in mathematics is correct. It definitely checkable. I mean, we believe that if someone comes out and says, I prove this conjecture, here is my proof, it may take us a couple of years to check it, but we can check it. It's well defined whether it's a proof or not. Therefore, any proof system that we usually use for mathematics is not complete. And by not complete means there are true statements that cannot be proven, which is a revolution in the sense that the intuition about mathematics is that if something is true, then we will eventually find a proof to it. Yes? Can you give me an example of what exactly is something that's true but not unable to prove? Yeah, I mean, so the, the point is that Gödel just showed that such things must exist because no system satisfies these three properties. 30 years later, uh, there was another great mathematician, which is Paul Cohen, in the early 1960s, and he was the first one to be able to show that for specific questions that people ask about mathematics, uh, we cannot show whether they are correct, whether they are true or not. So he showed it for things like, uh, so he, I mean, I, I will have to explain a little bit what this means. So the continuum hypothesis is, neither provable nor refutable. So what is the continuum hypothesis? If you know, I mean, those of you that were in the special lecture, they know that if we look at sizes of infinity, we know that the mi minimum size of infinity is the infinity of the natural numbers. And then there is the infinity of the real numbers. And Cantor proved at the beginning of the 20th century that there is a strict separation here. This is strictly bigger than this. The real numbers are strictly bigger than the natural numbers as infinity. But then a natural question arises is, is there anything in between? So we can ask, is there a some kind of size, a subset of the real numbers that is strictly bigger than the natural numbers, but is strictly smaller than the full real numbers? That's a very natural question to ask once you see Cantor's theorem. Cantor's theorem tells us this infinity is bigger than this infinity. So you ask, OK, is it the next one? And Paul Cohen proved in 1960 that we cannot neither prove it nor disprove it. Now, you can say this is not a statement about natural numbers. He came up with a technique, the technique called the forcing technique. And it's basically the only technique that we have so far for showing that things are independent. You call it independent of the proof system. And we can show, by now, we can show many, many, many properties, many statements, many mathematical statements we can show that they are independent. So, Modern mathematicians that are aware of Gödel's theorem, when they face an open problem, they know that there are three options. The answer will be yes, the answer will be no, the answer will be there is no answer. <laughs> and anyway, so these are the consequences of, of Gödel's theorem. And let's, let's show the proof. The proof is surprisingly easy. So, yes? Are there any problems where it has been proved that you cannot prove that it's provable or unprovable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I will talk about this maybe later. I mean, you're dragging me. But uh, Gedel already thought about it. So, so let's see this. I mean, so, so and, and here, you see, what we're going to do is we started by showing that uh, we had a few theorems last time. So we had a theorem one 
and it says that no algorithm can uh, decide for every uh, binary string x and number k if the Kolmogorov complexity of x equals k. That was the first theorem we showed. And it was kind of by using this trick of the Berry paradox. If I could decide it, then I could write a program that finds the first number, the first string whose Kolmogorov complexity is bigger than k, but the program itself will show that its Kolmogorov complexity is less than k. OK, so that was rather simple. And from that, we use that to deduce theorem 2 that says no algorithm can decide the halting problem So here we are given a program and an input, and we ask, will the program hold on this input? So now we want to show we can reduce from any of these, from this one or from this one, we want to show Gödel's theorem. So I can I can it doesn't matter which one. Let's let's do it from Kolmogorov complexity. To do Geltian. So what we will use the same kind of argument. We assume by way of contradiction that there is such a proof system. And then if there's such a proof system, we will get a contradiction to theorem one. So assume by way of contradiction that such a proof system exists. So we have a. So now I will show you how to use this proof system to solve the Kolmogorov complexity problem that we know we cannot solve. Right? So now let us. Use it to solve the Kolmogorov complexity problem. So what are we going to do? So you're given, I want to show you an algorithm that for every x and every k, holds and tells you whether the Kolmogorov complexity of x is k or not. Right? So the, the only point to note here is here is, the, here is my algorithm. So on input x and k, x is a binary string. Now, the, the only, OK, let me write it and then I'll explain. The, on input x and k, what we are going to do is we are going to here, I, I describe to you how the algorithm is going to work, right? So go over all uh, strings of characters, all finite strings of characters in the language of our proof system in lexicographic uh, order. We, in lexicographic order, I mean we start by all strings of lengths one, then all strings of lengths two. So uh, in, of, on increasing 
length. OK, so now I'm going over all strings of uh, characters of my proof system. And what do I do when I get some string? On string s, check if it is a valid proof of k of x equals k or of k of x is not equal k. Now note that this program, first of all, to, to, if I take a string and I have a statement, why, how do I know that I can check if this string is a proof of the statement or not? Yes? Because the proof system is checkable, right? So I have a subroutine that check if it's a proof of the statement or not, right? Now, why will it halt? Why will I get either get to a string that proves that k of x equals k, or I'll get to a straight proof of this? Because of completeness. One of those two statements is correct. Either the complexity of x is k, or the complexity of x is not k. One of them is correct. But my proof system can prove anything that is correct. So eventually, I'll get to a proof of one of those. I go over all, every proof is finite. So I go on, on order of the, just all sequences in decreasing order of the sequences, and in every order lexicographic over the sequences of these lengths. Right? And then you know that since we have completeness, my system does prove this or does prove this. I'm going one by one over the proofs. Eventually, I'll get to the proof of the correct statement. So I, this is an algorithm that outputs whether this is the case. So no, now, how do I know that if I proved it, then this is indeed the common goal of complexity? Because of soundness. So I use the checkability. I use the completeness because to know that I have one of these two proofs. And I use the soundness to know that if I did find a proof of this, this is indeed the case. I can trust it. See? So that's very simple. But I mean, if you go into the literature and check for proofs of Gödel's theorem, you'll find things which are very complex and long. And uh... OK, so there is some complication, small complication hiding here. And this is because I wanted the proof system from the natural numbers. And that, is this a question about natural numbers? So. I mean, I have to translate this into a question about natural numbers. So this is a natural number. And a binary string, I can definitely view it as a natural number. So the question is, how can I translate this into a natural number, into a question about some statement about natural numbers? Right? But the statement about natural numbers is, so the, and that's, that's the only kind of uh, point that I'm sweeping under the rung here. And this is how can we translate a statement k of x equals some number k to a statement about natural numbers. Because my proof system, I mean, the, my proof system didn't, I mean, I, it's not that I was, Gedel was claiming that this proof system should be able to answer any question, you know. Is there God? 
okay, either there's a proof that there is or there's a proof that there isn't. I'm only very modest, I want to say it can answer questions about natural numbers. So I have to convince you that this is indeed a question about number, uh, natural numbers. Right? But what is this question is saying? Is that x and k can be viewed as natural numbers because that's a binary string. Binary string is a natural number. That's a natural number. But what is k of x? k of x, if I can just translate it, I want to show you as how to translate it into a statement about natural numbers. So k of x equal k means the following. There exist p such that p is a, what language did we cite the Kolmogorov complexity is in? C++, okay. A C++ program of length k that on the empty input outputs x and holds. So, and I also want to say no shorter program does it. No, no, but I gave you here an algorithm that does it for every x and every k. My algorithm does it for every a, a, k. You, here is my algorithm. You give me input x, k, any x and k. And here is how my algorithm runs. This is for every x and every k. The algorithm will always give you the, the right answer. Your algorithm, I think, is a little bit tricky. Your algorithm goes through all possible proofs in, in your input Right, right. It goes uh, in, in increasing order through all possible proof. But since there is, for every x and every k, either there will be a proof of this yeah. or there will be a proof of this. When there will be a proof, it will be a finite proof. So it's some finite step. My algorithm will find the proof and hold. So yeah, I guess I see the trick is just that your algorithm is able to go through all the proofs in the system. Right, but that's because it, things are checkable and proofs are finite. So I can in, enumerate, just go over all finite candidates of being proofs. For each of them I check, is it a proof using the checkability? If it's not a proof, I throw it to the garbage. If it is a proof, I check, does it prove one of these statements? Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's crucial that we have a checkability of our proof system. But, of course, this is also a crucial fact uh, requirement for any proof system. It's not something artificial. There's no point in a proof system if you cannot check what is a proof and what is not a proof. Okay? No, the algorithm takes as input a single proof and just tells you, is it a good proof or not? That's everything you need. You just invoke this algorithm over and over again. You go over all the sequences, you take a sequence, invoke your checker, the checker tells you if it's proof or not, go to the next sequence. You invoke your checker, okay? So there's no cheating there. Okay, so I want to show you why this is a statement about natural numbers. But what is the statement? There exists a program, but you know, you see what is a program. A program is just a finite, uh, I can write a program in, in a language in which everything is like binary. It's kind of a binary string. So this is, there exists a program, is there exists a number. And that is a C++ a program is just a property of this number. I mean, I, I take the, my binary string and I can describe which binary strings are legal C++ programs and that's, I can write it as a property of this string. So the program can be written as a string of zeros and ones. That's what actually happens once you write the program. The, compiler had to, when you had to run it, it translates into a string of zeros and ones. And the compiler actually checks if this is a, a, a legal C++ program or not. So this is a property of this string. It's a property of the number. 
that it's a legal program. And the length k is also a property of this number. And so everything here is actually can be translated into a statement about numbers. I mean, it, you, we can do it in two steps. We can say, OK, the Geddes theorem tells, you, tells us what we see now is there is no proof system that can decide any statement about programs, which is sound and complete and checkable about programs. But having a statement about natural numbers allows us to have a statement that talks about programs, because I can encode every program as a natural number. OK? So we proved the Gettel's theorem. So we have everything that we need. And, and this is, OK, so let me talk a little bit about the consequences of the Gettel theorem. I mean, from now on, we are, we are done with what we wanted to do. So we can just uh, philosophize. Yeah? Um, what do the other more complex proofs have that this proof doesn't? Why do they need? Um, yeah. Are more, more complex proofs in the literature prove it for? Larger structures than that. No, 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 no. It's it's all about. I mean, if you look at the proof and and ask why is it so complex, it is due to two things. First of all, they they go into a lot of discussion of why can this translate into a property of natural numbers, which I think for everybody who is familiar with computer and programming languages is pretty natural. Because you know that you write the program, the program is being translated to a binary string. Binary string and natural number are the same. There is a, a compiler that checks it. So all of this, I mean, the, the proof was there much before there were real programs and real computers. So most of the effort goes into this, saying this is a property of natural numbers. So this is how the proof in the literature, this is a sketch of how the proof in the literature no, goes? No, no, no. The proof in the literature, the classical proof of Gödel, is in the sense of saying, I can say in the natural numbers a statement of the type, this statement is false. So, so Gödel actually constructed a Gödel sentence, which was a statement in, in the language of natural numbers, which encoded, you see, if, you have a, if I have a statement phi of x, uh, say I have a statement phi, and I want to know if n uh, satisfies phi or not. So what Gödel went is to through the real hard work of showing that this can be translated to a statement on, in natural numbers, which is much harder, because you can, this is not a natural number. And then once he could show that this can be translated into a statement about natural numbers, he wrote a phi, a psi, that says, you know, I am wrong, basically. And then, if it's true, then it's wrong. And if it's wrong, then it's true. And he got the contradiction. But he put a lot of work into showing that such a statement could be translated to a statement about natural numbers, which is not obvious at all. Because this is not a natural number. This is a kind of a, an infinite structure. So we kind of still convert it with the tools of, with kind of the thinking of, of algorithms and computers. And we, I mean, anyway, I mean, this proof is, is, is fresh. I mean, that I came up with it two, two days ago. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there, there are similar proofs in there. OK, so, so what are the consequences of this? So, we know, so, so first co corollary, so we have lots of corollaries. And, and the first corollary is, as we said already, that there are true mathematical statements that are not provable. But if you see such a statement, you should ask yourself, I mean, there's something fishy here. I want to know if it's true. Yeah. Okay, all right. 
how do we know that it's true? So we can rephrase it. I mean, first of all, I, I know that there are true statements which are false. So, okay, let, let's do it step by step. Our first step, when I say provable, I have to tell you in what system, what proof system. So this has to do for every sound and checkable proof system and that's provable in that system. Okay? Now, how do I know that they are true? I just know, I don't know that the particular statement is true. I just know that otherwise it would be complete and I can't have completeness on top of checkable and soundness. So it's not that I can show you some concrete thing that I tell you it's true. But we know because I have soundness and checkable, it cannot be complete. It cannot be complete means there's something which is true and, the, and the, the, is not provable, right? Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is I can say, okay, so let's go to this question of how do we know that it's true. So the, the conclusion is that there are these statements that we don't know if they are true or not. I mean, now this, this comes to the question, to almost a philosophical question. Is mathematics an object that is really there in the world? And I can ask, is something true or not? I mean, is it raining outside or not? It's well defined, I can go outside and see if it's raining or not. But if I ask you, are there infinitely many pairs of prime numbers, blah, 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 then it's not as, I mean, the, is the natural numbers an object in reality? Or it's only whatever we put into it, which is something that satisfies our axioms, and so what is the notion of true, you see? So there is this kind of two views of mathematics. Is mathematics talking about a real object, or is it just the invention of our minds? But if we want to still convey this difficulty, we can take this statement and translate it to a different statement. And it will say that for every, for every uh, proof system for mathematics, which is rich enough, can talk about natural numbers, so another corollary, for every proof system, there will be statements that are neither provable nor refutable in the system. So if we don't want to talk about what's true, we don't believe that mathematics is a real, real object and there's a not notion of truth, but we can know that there are st statements that you will not be able to show that because right, either, I mean, we have phi and we have not phi. We know that in any structure for the natural numbers, one of them will be true. If it doesn't, if it's a state, if it's a sentence, one of them is true, and we don't know which. Because we, sure, we cannot prove phi. If phi is true, we cannot prove not phi because of soundness, and because we are not complete, we cannot prove phi. And now we can ask, okay, so we have this statement, and this is for every system which is as strong as the natural numbers. So what about what do we do in mathematics when it, when mathematicians prove something? Do we have some kind of a proof system that we can formalize that captures what is a mathematical proof? So the next step is to ask not just about natural numbers, but about mathematics in general. I prove some statement about groups. I prove some statements about vector uh, spaces. I prove some statements about geometry. It's not necessarily natural numbers. We all have some kind of a notion of what is a mathematical proof. So do we have a language? So it turns out that, I mean, after uh, Gedel, this became kind of a crucial question of trying to formalize what do we mean when we say a mathematical proof. So there was the what 
is a mathematical proof. What is the proof system that mathematicians use? And then there were a set theory addressed this issue, axiomatic set theory, and there were people like Cermelo and Frankel, and uh, like 10 years, in, in the 50s of the 50th century, and they came up with what is called ZFC, which is Z stands for Cermelo, F stands for Frankel, C stands for something different, which is choice. But <laughs> anyway, this is a proof system. They came up with a formal proof system that is accepted by any mathematician today that this is actually how we do mathematics. So we have a formalism for how we do mathematics. So now that we have a formalism for, so the Mellon and Frankel, they came out with this proof system that is an accepted, commonly accepted formal system of mathematical proofs. And then, so we have this notion, and, and indeed, uh, the statement of uh, Paul Coyne that I showed you before is about this ZFC. So I can phrase it more precisely. ZFC cannot prove that uh, R is the next size above the size of n. And it cannot prove that R is not the next size above n. It can neither prove it nor refute it. And when we, and this is called the continuum hypothesis, and it's talked about our tools of mathematics. And, and there are many more mathematical statements like this. So what do you do as a mathematician if you have such a problem? I want to know whether there is a size between natural numbers and real numbers. Yes? Well, can, can we, since we already have them, can we just enrich it by adding more? Very nice. We will enrich it. So that's a nice solution. I mean, if this is what you want, OK, let's take ZFC plus the continuum hypothesis. This is called. This is called the continuum hypothesis. So let this, this be my new system, ZFC plus the continuum hypothesis. And maybe now my problems are solved. Are my problems solved now? What? Yeah, but can you show me that it's not solved? Just because of Gödel's theorem. I mean. This is also will suffer from the same problem of Gödel's theorem. So I can add another. I mean, I, I will find something else that's not decidable, and I'll add that too. What will happen if I keep adding all kind of statements? What, what will be the kind of the limits? When will it break down this process? I'll get a contradiction. Maybe at some point. It will become inconsistent. Does it become inconsistent? Because we know that the more power you put to your proof system, the more likely it is to be able to prove everything or a statement in its negation. So, we would like to be very careful and say, OK, keep checking that this is consistent. So we really want to be able to prove the statement ZFC is consistent. Now note that this is a very clear mathematical statement. It just say, for every alpha, 
there is no proof of alpha and the proof of not alpha. It's a mathematical statement, very clear. If I have a proof system that talks about mathematical statements, it should be able to say this ZFC is consistent. Right? And can I prove it? Can I prove that our mathematics is consistent? It's, what do you think? See, if our mathematics is not consistent, it means that actually everything in mathematics has a proof. True things, false things, nonsense, everything has a proof. So can we show that mathematics is consistent? So this is the second Gödel's theorem. And the second Gödel's theorem it says no a meaningful, let's leave the meaningful uh, undefined proof system can prove its own consistency. Now, we need the caveat here. There is some situation in which a system will be able to prove its consistency. What is this situation? No, unless it is inconsistent, right? Because if it's inconsistent and it can prove anything, then it can also prove I am consistent. So, yeah, I mean, meaningless, but, but the, the nice thing here is that this puts us in this very funny situation. We don't know if mathematics is consistent, which is a very troublesome situation. We don't know maybe mathematics is nonsense, really. <laughs> but if someone ever proves to us that mathematics is consistent, then we know that he proved to us that mathematics is inconsistent. <laughs> Because if the system can prove its own consistency, it's inconsistent. <laughs> so we don't know if mathematics is nonsense. And in every, if anybody ever shows us that it's not nonsense, it's a proof that it is nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah. so the question is, what system, what proof system did uh, Godel base his proof on? Right. right. So we, we really have to now start being careful about what we are doing. But Right, but uh, I mean, I, I don't want to, to get into this, but the, all those things are, the main thing is that we are in this really funny situation. And so, you know, if, if I go, I, I was, I, I did my, my PhD in this area of axiomatic set theory. And when I was doing my PhD, you know, there are conferences where people submit papers to a conference. I don't know if you know it, when you go to academia, you will know it. You submit papers to the conference. There is a committee that reviews the papers, decide who will. So there was a conference of set theorists, and they got papers. And they got two papers from two very famous mathematicians. And one of them proved some statement A, and the other one proved not A. <laughs> now, in any other area of mathematics, people will say, OK, you know, go home, check it. One of you is wrong. But in set theory, they say, oh, maybe, I mean, maybe mathematics is inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> because this is a possibility. We cannot rule it out. So there was some kind of a big worry, because both of them are very reputable mathematicians. And it's not inconceivable that both of them were correct and that whole mathematics co collapses. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily, in, those, in this case, one of them retracted this proof. <laughs> so, but if you ever show, you see, if you ever show inconsistency, you know what you should do with it, right? Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Just use it to prove everything from now on. I mean, you will become the most famous mathematician. <laughs> because we know that from alpha and not alpha, we can prove beta for any beta, right? So if you have a proof of inconsistency, just keep it to yourself and carefully, like once a year, solve some big open problem. <laughs> yes? What if people start noticing that you solve all the problems in the same way? 
<laughs> I, I, I'm not the one to give you, uh, you know, hints on how to cheat. But so yeah, so we are in this really, really very, very strange situation, and. Let me, I mean, okay, so ZFC is a very kind of strong proof system. This is what we believe, that all of mathematics can be done in the ZFC, and we have this unclarity, some statements that cannot be decided, and we don't know if it's consistent. What about, say we are more modest, and all we care about is not all of mathematics, but only the natural numbers. So for the natural numbers, we have, I already mentioned it to you, if we, we don't want, you see, this, the statement here, this statement, the continuum hypothesis, is not about natural numbers, it's about infinities. So we can ask, what about statements about natural numbers? Do we have similar situation? So for proof system in, for natural numbers, we use for proofs on uh, on natural numbers, we use a weaker system, weaker than the full ZFC system, which is called Peano arithmetic. I already mentioned it before. So it has things like, you know, statements like, uh, there is a zero uh, for every x, zero plus x equals x, and for every x, uh, one times x equals one, and for every x, for every y, x plus y equals y plus x, and so on. It's a very simple system. It captures the basic uh, properties of arithmetic plus the induction principle, yes? Uh, it's x, yeah, <laughs> right. But I will not count it as a mistake. <laughs> and uh, so that's Peano arithmetic. And it turns out that Peano arithmetic, we can prove that it is consistent. So, but not, the system itself cannot prove it is consistent. But ZFC, which is the stronger theorem, can prove that PA is consistent. So mathematics, what we use for mathematics, can show that this system is consistent. How, how, how will you prove that the system is consistent? No. How do you prove? I mean, if, uh, this is a good preparation for the exam. If I ask you in the exam, prove to me that the following set of formulas is consistent, what will you do? Yes? You find something that is consistent. Right. What? You find something that is consistent. And how do you show it can prove it? You want, yeah, that's one way. I mean, find something that it can't prove. But then you have to show me that it can't prove it, which is not easy. But there is a much easier solution. I mean, you just, yes? Using satisfiability, we know that consistent and satisfiable is the same. So if I show you a structure that satisfies it, then I got consistency. Which structure do we know that satisfies all of those properties of natural numbers? The natural numbers. The natural numbers. <laughs> so this is just the statement that ZFC can prove that natural number, can prove that natural numbers exist. And that's all. Because satisfiability means consistency. And of course, we want a mathematical proof system in which you can prove that the natural numbers exist. And it turns out that the only component that is missing here, if I tell you there is a 0, there is a 1, there is a plus operation, there is a times operation, I almost gave you all of the natural numbers. The component that is missing here is we need to add on top of it a statement that's saying plus there exists an infinite set. I 
I mean, this, there exists a set of all natural numbers. By just talking about properties of numbers, I will never prove to you that there is the set of all natural numbers. So if we add the existence of an infinite set, we get this is what the full mathematics shows. Yes? Well, how do you show that n satisfies this? That n satisfies this. I mean, I didn't show you. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really valid question, because you ask me how do I show that n satisfies this, I can ask you back what is n. Right. So ZFC constructs the natural numbers very carefully. And so he says, you know, this will be the, represent, the number one, and the, the number zero, this is the empty set. And this will be the number one, and this will be the number two, and so every number will be a set. You can, you can show in, in axiom, the axiom of set theory that the empty set exists, that if there is a set, then there is a set that contains only that set. So for every n, you will have the n plus 1 is the set consisting of the set uh, n and what? Pi on top of n. Yeah, anyway. We can, we can, I don't want to get into this game. Uh, so you can construct each of them, and then you say there exists an infinite set. So there is a set of all of those. And then you have to define, based on those, what is plus, what is the interpretation of plus, what is the interpretation of times, and show that it satisfies all those axioms. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and it's, you have for this to know what are the axioms of set theory. They basically tell you there exists an empty set, if you have a set, then you have a set that contains it. If you have two sets, you have the union, and so on. Anyway, that's a very delicate construction. So, okay. And maybe one, one more, okay. Uh, so now I can ask, okay, is there a, if now that I know that ZFC can show that it's consistent, and ZFC can construct a model of natural numbers, can I show you a specific statement about natural numbers that is true? Now I have this structure that is true in the model, but not provable. Can I show you a statement about natural numbers that is true and not provable? You see what I'm, and for example, is P versus P equals NP, could it be a statement which is true and not provable? So I want to just finish with an example of such a statement, just that you will see that things are not completely in the air. So the, this, I, I want to, I mean, yeah, there are too many things one can go to from here, but let me show you such a statement. So for a statement about natural numbers, I want to show you a statement about natural numbers that is true, but with the axiom of natural numbers, we cannot prove it. But I can prove from a bigger system that is true. Right? And so this is called Ramsey, Ramsey theorems. Any of you heard about Ramsey theorems before? So Ramsey theorems are, are really a fun area in mathematics and combinatorics. So Ramsey theorem says the following. I mean, the simplest version of it says, if you have a group of six people Say I have a group of six people, and some of them know each other and some don't. So let us put an edge whenever I have two people that know each other. So if I have a, I, I have a small party, and I invited six people, and some of them know each other already and some of them don't, there will always be three people such that either none of them know each other or all three know each other. So, so if I have six people, no matter how they are arranged, there will always be three of them such that either all three know each other or none of the three know each other, no matter how I arrange it. And more generally, it says the following. It says that for every, for every number m, there exists
a number n such that every graph v e on n vertices either a contains a click of size M or a free subset of size M. So do you all know what is a click in a graph? If I have a graph, a click is a subset of the vertices that all the edges between them exist. And a free set is a subset of the vertices that have no edges between them. So uh, this is a very interesting direction in mathematics. It tells you that if you have enough elements, then there will be some simple structure inside. You cannot avoid having a simple structure inside. So if you take enough nodes, if you have enough nodes, and you try to now draw a graph between them, add edges, right? So I'll say that a simple structure is either a structure that has no nodes among them, or a structure that has all the, po all, no edges, or the structure that has all the possible edges. Those are very simple structures. And what the Ramsey theorem tells you, if you have enough nodes, then no matter how you put the edges, you will not be able to kill all the simple structures. There's going to be a simple structure of size m. So for any n, there is an m with a simple structure of size m. And this is, this is the direction in mathematics which is uh, useful because it has lots of kind of uh, surprising consequences. And it's called Ramsey theorems. And this is called the Ramsey numbers. So the minimum such n is the Ramsey number of m. And it turns out that we don't know much about them. I mean, the, we know that in order to get three, we need six. And those numbers grow very fast. And we, uh, we know what is the, so this is the third Ramsey number. There's the fourth number. How many edges do I need to know if I just want to get two? How many vertices do I need in order to just get either a click of size two or a free set of size two? Yes? Two. Right. If I just take a graph of two edges, of two vertices, then either there is a free set of size two or there is a click of size two. So the Ramsey number for two is very simple, it's two. The Ramsey number for three is six. It's a bit more complicated. The Ramsey number for five or six, I think, is already unknown. <laughs> it's already an open problem in mathematics. But we can prove that they exist. Now, if we add something, which I will not go into the details, we add something to the Ramsey requirement. I, the, the requirement that I add is, uh, you see, I, I can say my vertices are natural numbers. So my vertices are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I want to add the requirement that there exists a clique or a free set of size m such that the smallest vertex participating in this clique is m. Like, there is no number smaller than m that participates in the clique. I just add a small requirement that the, I have identities for the points, and I want to say I'll have a big enough set, which is simple, and it doesn't contain numbers which are smaller than its size. Anyway, it's not a very interesting problem, except that we can show that it's true, but you cannot prove it from the axioms of natural numbers. Although it's just a statement of natural numbers. 
So uh, this statement is not really interesting. The Ramsey theorems are really interesting because they are key in many things in mathematics. It's good to know that they, such a thing exists. And by adding this small decoration to it, we get a statement that we know it's true if we use full mathematics, but it's just a statement about natural numbers. For every m, there exists an n such that we cannot prove it with just natural numbers. OK. So this is as far as I want to go in the, I mean, there are many other topics that I didn't cover, but we don't have time to get into them in 20 minutes. So are there any questions in this point? Yes. So first, we use CFC to prove that uh, piano is consistent. Right. So are we able to construct an even stronger system that proves Right, this system, ZFC. You see, he asks, ZFC is strong enough to show that parallel is consistent. So can I come up with a theorem that's strong enough to show that ZFC is consistent? That's very simple. ZFC plus consistency of ZFC. <laughs> <laughs> I will add it as an extra axiom. So now I can prove that ZFC is consistent because it's an axiom here. OK, now you can ask, oh, maybe it's inconsistent, but we know what happens to inconsistency. <laughs> yes? Uh, so is PA plus PA is consistent equivalent to ZFC? Uh, oh, it's, no, it's weaker than ZFC. But PA plus there exists an infinite set is, is equivalent to ZFC. Yeah. So if um, ZFC is not consistent, do, uh, do we still think that uh, PA is consistent? <laughs> yeah, that's a, good, that's a strange question. We, we don't want to think about this situation. <laughs> <laughs> because if ZFC is inconsistent, it means that mathematical proofs are meaningless. Right? Because ZFC captures mathematical proofs. It's inconsistent means you can, with mathematical proofs, prove everything. So you can prove that PA is consistent. You can prove it's inconsistent. You can prove anything you want. So that, that's not the thing. We all believe that it's consistent. There used to be. I mean, that's why it's called ZFC. That's why they, they added the C for the axiom of choice. So I can, I don't know how much patience you have for these kind of abstract things. The, the axiom of choice, I, I can say something about the axiom of choice. So the axiom of choice is the statement that if you have a collection of sets, then you have a set that picks one element from each of them. Which, it's a, I don't even want to go into the statement. It sounds very strange. Why do I have to worry if I have a collection of non-empty sets, I have a set that picks one of any of them. But, so that's called the axiom of choice. Axiom of choice. But axiom of choice is very important because it's equivalent to many statements in mathematics. So it's equivalent for example, to the statement that every uh, vector space has a basis. So this is, definite, this is a theorem that you probably heard about if you learn linear algebra. Linear algebra, we take a vector space, we say every vector space has a basis. Turns out that this statement is equivalent to the axiom of choice. Or it's equivalent to another statement, which is really nice statement in geometry. So in geometry, there is a statement which is called Han Banach theorem, which looks completely trivial, which says, if I have two convex, oh, two convex sets. So a convex set is a set such that if I take two points and I connect them, then the line that connects them remains inside the set. So if I take two convex sets in our n, I can find a linear separator that separates them. That sounds like a very natural thing. You see, if they are not convex, I cannot, if they are not convex, I can say, this is one of my sets, this is the other set, I cannot find a linear separator between them. I cannot separating, separate them by a linear cut. So there is a statement that says, if both sets are convex, then I can find 
a linear separator between them. This is called the Hahn-Banach theorem. It, it, it looks like obvious, right? If I draw it on the on that board, it, this is also equivalent to the axiom of choice. So it looks like oh, everything it's all natural. It's all very pr natural properties. Why would this be so controversial that we have to specify in our proof system there is ZFC with choice and there is the proof system ZF without choice? Why, why is it controversial? It's controversial because it turns out that on top of all those nice properties, it also has very unpleasant consequences. <laughs> so it has some unpleasant consequences. So some unpleasant consequences of the axiom of choice. So remember, the axiom of choice is just this statement, every linear space have a basis, every two convex sets can be divide, uh, separated by a line, very natural thing. But what are the, un so one of them is that if I look at the uniform distribution over the line, over the unit interval. So I look at the unit interval and I look at the uniform distribution. So we all know what it is, right? So what is the probability of the set from a quarter to three quarters? What is the probability of hitting the set in the uniform distribution? Half. Half, right? What is the probability of hitting a set that contains only one point? Zero. Zero. Oh, you know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so one consequence of the axiom of choice is that there exists a set that has no probability. So the probability of hitting it is not zero. But the probability of hitting it is not bigger than zero. What exactly is not zero and not bigger than zero? It is just, it doesn't have a probability. <laughs> so this is an unpleasant consequence of the axiom of choice. So that's why it was controversial. I mean, do you want to have this or do you want to have this? You cannot have both. If you have these nice properties, then you must have also this. And Another kind of, I mean, I can even describe to you the set, but another unpleasant consequence of the axiom of choice is the following statement. That you can take a ball in R3, I don't know how to draw a ball in R3, and divide it into eight pieces, and divide it into eight pieces, and without changing the geometry at all. So you just cut it into eight pieces. And three of them can be put together to create a ball like the original one. And five of them, the five others, can also be put together to create a ball like the original one. Without bending, without stretching, without anything. Just taking the pieces and moving them around. No, I'm not joking. I mean, and, and this is a very useful theorem because all you have to do is you buy some gold. You <laughs> <laughs> so this is also, a, it's called the Banach paradox and it's also something we can prove with the axiom of choice. So when we try to look very carefully at what we are doing in mathematics, we run into problems. So one of our big problems was that we cannot prove that we are consistent. Another small problem was this question of the axiom of choice that initially looks very natural, but we can also get all kind of unpleasant consequences. But everybody prefers to live with this. So mathematics today takes the axiom of choice as a common tool in mathematics. And we just live with the fact that there are subsets of the real nine that have no probability. And the ball can be divided in such a funny way, but this is a mathematical ball. Any real ball, you know, it has atoms, and I cannot cut the atoms in, in the half in between, so there is no danger that anybody will use it to generate gold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is as much as I can tell you in this course. It was a big pleasure for me. Thank you very much. I, oh, one more thing. I will have, uh, the problem is that I'm going away next Thursday. 
And I want to give you another chance to, if you start preparing for the exam, although the exam is only almost 10 days from now, so I guess it's, it's very far in the future to start studying. But if you want to have a, I will have a question answering session. Uh, I want to just pick a time that is good for everybody. So like Wednesday next week is the furthest I can do it. Um, are there any, uh, do, are any people here that would like to come and have an exam on Wednesday? Ne Wednesday next week. I just want to find a time that will be good for as many people as possible, and then I'll find a room. So, yeah, who has an exam next Wednesday? When? What time? 9.30 in the morning. 9.30 in the morning. Anybody else? Yes. 9. 9 in the morning. Anybody has an exam on Wednesday afternoon? When? 4 o'clock. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's becoming problematic because you, you probably will not have time, uh, the, the peace of mind for, for it before your exam, right? Yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll try to make it as late as possible Wednesday afternoon and I'll put on Piazza and uh, learn the time and place for the review uh, session. Okay, thank you very much.